Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning and welcome to all of you who are joining us here in person, as well as those of you who are joining us through the live stream. Uh, My name is John. I serve as the lead pastor here at Elmwood, and if I haven't had the opportunity to meet you, I'd love to connect with you sometime after the gathering today. Uh, As you know, today is uh, the day after the 4th of July. And uh, if you didn't know this, uh, in case you didn't know what all the, uh, the incessant explosions were last night that began at uh, about dusk and went halfway through the night, uh, it's Fourth of July weekend. Uh, and so this is a time when uh, many of us, this is a, a favorite national holiday for us. It's a time to celebrate uh, the independence that we have as a country. Uh, this is the way that our family celebrated yesterday. It was uh, our two daughters had their first sparkler experience. Uh, you can tell by Chloe's face how excited she is, and McKenna's just like eyes locked on like, ooh, fire, fire. <laughs> so that was our experience yesterday. Um, I'm sure you all did some exciting, fun stuff as well. Um, there's a lot that's going on in our country and a lot that's going on in our world right now, and so I just wanted to sort of give you a little bit of a window into uh, how I'm processing this 4th of July. On the one hand, I have never been more thankful to be a citizen of the United States. I have never been more thankful for those who have served in our military, uh, many of whom are members of Elmwood Church here. And I've never been more thankful for the number of freedoms that we have uh, being a part of this country. Uh, And at the same time, I've I've never been more aware of the ways in which uh, we don't fully experience the ideals that are laid out in our founding documents. Now, just to be clear, uh, we should celebrate the good things that we see and experience in our country, and there are many of them, are there not? There are many things that we should see and experience, and I think the way that we can do the best job of honoring and loving and respecting our country is by keeping a proper perspective on our citizenship. I think that as we think about the gift of being a part of a country like ours, uh, with all of the good parts, with all of the warts and the faults, that come along with that, this should, as as we think about being citizens of our country, this should only increase our thankfulness to God that through Jesus he has made us citizens of the kingdom of heaven. He's made us citizens of the kingdom of God, and so I want to direct your attention to the words that the Apostle Paul says in the book of Philippians. He says, but our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control, will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. What a beautiful uh, promise, what a beautiful reminder. And it could not be more fitting that this morning we have the Abel family with us, all the way from Paraguay, who are serving in cross-cultural gospel ministry down there. And having them with us today is a beautiful and fitting reminder that the good news about Jesus is not bound to one people group, it's not bound to one ethnicity, to one culture, to one language, or to one location. And so we love and we cherish and we honor and we treasure the country that we live in, and we do so remembering that the Lord has made us citizens of, as the book of Hebrews says, a better country. And so this morning, I just want to uh, ask you to stand as we worship uh, and be called to worship by the words of Psalm 103. The psalmist says, praise the Lord, my soul, all my inmost being, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion, who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all the oppressed. The Lord has established his throne in heaven and his kingdom rules over all. Praise the Lord, you his angels, you mighty ones who do his bidding, you who obey his word. Praise the Lord, all his heavenly hosts, you who serve, you servants who do his will. Praise the Lord, all his works everywhere in his dominion. Praise the Lord, my soul. And so this morning I'd like to invite you uh, to join us in worship of our God whose kingdom knows no end. Let's worship together. Creatures of our God and King, live 
lift up your voice and with us sing oh praise him hallelujah thou burning sun with golden beam thou silver moon with softer gleam oh praise him oh praise him Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. Now a rushing wind that aren't so strong. He clouds that sail in heaven along. Oh, praise him. Hallelujah, now a rising moon in praise rejoice, he likes a ring and find a voice, oh praise him, oh praise him, hallelujah, hallelujah. Let me invite you to open up a Bible on your phones or hard copy to Psalm 45. It's where our pastoral prayer is going to be out of. We're going to be looking at verses 10 through 17 this morning. We'll read through that, and then we'll pray through that, and then at the end we'll pray the Lord's Prayer. If you're unfamiliar with those words, they'll be right up on the screen behind me. So Psalm 45, verses 10 through 17. Listen, daughter, and pay careful attention. Forget your people and your father's house. Let the king be enthralled by your beauty. Honor him, for he is your Lord. The city of Tyre will come with a gift. People of wealth will seek your favor. All glorious is the princess within her chamber. Her gown is interwoven with gold. In embroidered garments, she is led to the king. Her virgin companions follow her. 
those brought to be with her. Led in with joy and gladness, they entered the palace of the king. Your sons will take the place of your fathers. You will make them princes throughout the land. I will perpetuate your memory through all generations. Therefore, the nations will praise you forever and ever. Let's pray. Lord, like a groom awaiting his bride, we thank you for your love for us. That in you we find relationship and deep intimacy. Every desire of our heart is met in fullness by you. You take us as we are and you make us beautiful, Lord, by your spirit. May we seek to be a people who follow your spirit's lead and so become holy before you that we might dwell with you forever. Lord, we pray that for those in our lives and in our community that they would see your beauty and the beauty of knowing you, Lord, and of the beauty of knowing your son. May they flock to him, Lord. May we be lights pointing to him in every context that we're in. Lord, we pray for revival. Father, we thank you that you are our king, always good and always strong. You go before us even in today's challenging circumstances and and in you there's no need to fear there is no need to doubt you call us to have faith lord and so we trust you lord help us to trust you not just today but in the days ahead and in things that we do not know lord but you do please forgive us for the ways lord that we've sinned against you for the ways that we've rebelled and and sought to rule over ourselves and and do things our own way help us to repent and turn back to you Lord, you, you told us by your son that, that you came to give us abundant life. So would you help us to live into the life that you've called us to? May people look at us and see just a glimpse of, of your good spirit working in us. And finally, Lord, we are grateful for our nation and, and the freedoms that we currently experience. Lord, we praise you for the blessings that we have, even the ones that we don't even recognize But Lord, we praise you more that you've called us into your kingdom, out of the kingdom of darkness into your glorious kingdom of light, and you've given us a new way. May our identity in this life and the way we live as citizens in this country and in countries abroad reflect your love and ultimately your kingdom. So we pray as you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We'll just have a few updates here for you. If you're new with us, usually we would have a connection cards in the pews in front of you for you to fill out so that we could get connected with you. Uh, but currently, due to the COVID stuff, uh, we're playing it safe when it comes to sanitation and trying to uh, love through the, the safety that we're trying to provide for everybody. So we would still love to connect with you. So you can uh, feel free to connect with Pastor John or I personally by coming up to us after or before a service, or you can go to elmwoodchurch.org slash connect and you can fill out a connection card and we will follow up with you through that. Many of you were probably updated on uh, the update that we need to our fire alarm system. We have many people that come to worship here at Elmwood and part of the deal with stewarding this great resource of this building is that we need to uh, sometimes update our fire alarm so it's uh, up to code. So I wanna invite you to continue to pray for God's provision for that. That is a, a significant amount of money so please be praying for that and pray about how maybe God would be leading you to contribute and if you feel like he's leading you to give to that that um, in some way when you write your check, uh, you can designate that under uh, capital improvement or if you give online, there's a drop down menu that you can do for capital improvement on there. Well, as John said, we have Mafu and Nai. We're so happy that you both are here with us and your kids. It was good to chat with you just a little bit uh, before the service had started. So I want to invite you uh, both to come up and uh, just come tell us a little bit about what God is doing through you both um, and how things are going with your ministry. So We are missionaries Mafu and Nai Abel, and in this short video, we would like to introduce to you our family, our ministry calling, the location where we serve, 
and the vision that God has given us. Meet Zoe. She is, as her name indicates, full of life and tends to make friends for us wherever we go. This is Ian. He's just beginning to learn all the life has to teach him. He's a good baby. We serve a call by the AFLC to church planting in Paraguay. We are working to see non-believers brought into the kingdom, established in the word of God, and united to fellow believers in congregation. Paraguay has been labeled the heart of South America because of its location, landlocked between Bolivia, Argentina, and Brazil. The total population numbers approximately 7,200,000. Officially a bilingual country, 90% of the population speaks at least two languages, Spanish and Guarani or Jopara. Paraguay is home to 17 different First Nation groups with five distinct family languages. Paraguay has the highest consumption of tea per capita in the world, averaging over 26 pounds of tea per person annually. This is due to the custom of drinking tereré, an iced tea, mate, a hot tea, and cocido, a scorched tea. Paraguayan people in general prefer natural medicine over pharmaceuticals. So on any given street corner, you might find a jujo stand selling herbs and roots to be added to either the terere or the mate as remedy for numerous ailments. The heart of South America is also a land of sunshine with an average of 310 days of clear skies annually. Geographically, the country is mostly comprised of plains, farmland, and cattle land. The highest peak of the country isn't all that high. It's only 2,700 feet in altitude. For the past year, we've lived near the capital, Asuncion, at Mission Betania, a mission base of Bethany Fellowship. This place has been a missionary training center, a church, and a private school for over 20 years. Here we've been blessed to serve with the local church with Bible teaching, discipleship, and other ministry activities while we navigated the bureaucratic process of attaining permanent residency and getting other documentation. We also began learning the Guarani language and the culture of Paraguay while searching where God would have us begin a new missionary church plant. Throughout the year, we were intentional about networking with numerous church, mission, and parachurch ministries as well as nonprofit organizations in Paraguay. We foresee that this networking will prove itself beneficial as we minister in the Paraguayan countryside. We have also purposely maintained involvement with the Free Lutheran Church of Brazil by attending conferences, camps, as well as sitting on the board of the seminary and the retreat centers. Preaching about the missionary call and the urgency of evangelism is our soapbox in Brazil. To us, fulfilling the mission includes more than formal preaching and event planning. Mission is personal and holistic. The gospel affects all of life. We value having an open house where people can see Christ as they participate in our lives, share meals, play games, and have all kinds of conversation. Our kids benefit from having many tios and tias who love and care for them. Upon returning to Paraguay in August, we will resume our language classes as we look for housing in the Guaira department. We hope to be settled in the new location by Christmas 2020. Our efforts will be focused on two ministry fronts. One is friendship evangelism and Bible studies. The other is Campamento Uvuturusu. For church planting, we will undoubtedly employ various strategies in reaching people with the gospel. But one strategy that is central for us is that of evangelizing and inviting people to study God's word. We believe that Bible study groups will develop into free Lutheran churches as new believers are established in the word of God. We have the blessing of participating in a network of missionaries 
serving Christ in rural Paraguay. Campamento Uvuturu Sul is a camp founded by SIM. The camp is still in the development phase and we are going to be involved in the continued development of this camp. Camp ministry has always been a big part of our lives and we are excited to give continuation to this work. We invite you to pray for us as we seek to follow what God has put on our hearts, mainly church planting in towns and villages where there is currently no Christian influence. There's a great evangelistic need in Paraguay and there is a new movement of missionaries answering God's call to this nation. The gospel must go out and we are excited for the next steps ahead of us. Romans 15.20 says, It has always been my ambition to preach the gospel where Christ was not known. We invite you to partner with us as we spread the gospel in Paraguay. Go, pray, give. God bless you. Good morning. Good morning. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with you guys. Um, we have a history with this church. Um, it's fun to see some friendly faces, some familiar faces um, get, get reacquainted here. Um, as global citizens, we um, have friends in various places and we don't get to see a lot of them often. So it's, it's refreshing to see some of your faces still here um, and be able to visit. And new faces, um, it would be a pleasure to get to know you guys. First, I would like to point out we have a display out in the back. Pictures, we call these prayer cards. They have a little map of Paraguay and our names and our picture there. That's good for you to put in your Bible, put on your fridge somewhere where when you see us, you remember to pray for us. Um, we are going to be evangelizing, preaching the gospel. It's good news. It's great news. But we know that the one who brings life into a dead soul is the Holy Spirit. So as we preach the gospel, we depend on God to be working. And for some reason, God has chosen to work in response to the prayers of his people. So we depend on you guys. We depend on people praying so that the ministry might be fruitful that God would do his part um, of, of bringing life out of the gospel preached. We have that promise in scripture, and you get to be a part and join with this. Um, this sheet here has uh, just information how to give, so you can remember to do that um, online later if you would like. Also, it has our email address for you to be in touch with us via email. And you can subscribe to our newsletters. We have a clipboard back here if you'd like to write your email address on there and your name. We can add you to our email list. Also, these envelopes for giving. We have um, keychains and magnets spread out on the display table back there. Those are um, for you to take as well. We ask for a donation of any size for, for one or not. We're not checking. Um, Take one, remember us, and, um, and remember Paraguay and the need for world missions there. Um, this is my beautiful wife, Edenai. You've been introduced to her. I'll let her share a little bit about the song we'll be singing. Good morning. Uh, we will be singing a song in Spanish and in Guarani, and I want to translate for you. I want to sing a beautiful song about the man who changed me. I want to sing a beautiful song about the, who changed my life. He's my friend Jesus. He's God, he's king, he's love, he's truth. Just in him, I found the peace I was searching. Just in him, I found happiness. And this is the result that happened with someone when we meet Jesus. In him, we can find the true peace, the true life. And it's amazing that we can call this God, King, as our friend. So, let's sing. Quiero cantar una linda canción de un hombre que me transformó. Quiero 
Today's sermon text is from John 15, 1 to 17. The vine and the branches. I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this, that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends for everything that I learned from my Father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, and so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. This is my command, love each other. Here ends the reading. One of the things that uh, stuck out to me from the video we just saw was uh, the number 310. Anybody else, that 310, that number stuck out to you? 310 days of sun every single year <laughs> in Paraguay. Uh, I, I just, I wonder what that's like. And I, anybody else feeling a call to Paraguay? <laughs> can only imagine how great that would be. So I'm thankful for you. 
suffering for Jesus in Paraguay. (laughs) As we come to God's word today, would you uh, join me in prayer? Lord, we are so happy that we get to sit under the authority of your word. We thank you that you love us dearly, that you have made us your friends, and we thank you that you've given us your word to, uh, to guide us, to instruct us, to correct us, and to be the source that guides us into true and lasting life. So as we look at this passage, we ask, Lord, that you would illuminate it for our eyes. We pray, Holy Spirit, that even in this moment that you would be working in unique and powerful ways to draw our attention to what's in this passage. Give us wakefulness, give us uh, kind of attentiveness to your word, uh, and Lord, we ask that you would change us. Uh, Take what we see in this passage today and use it for our ongoing transformation and for the good of our community and our city and our world. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, starting next week, we are beginning a short sermon series uh, in the book of Jonah titled uh, The Unrelenting Love of God. And I want to encourage you as you uh, prepare for next Sunday uh, that you would spend time uh, preparing your hearts and preparing your minds by just spending time in the book of Jonah. So whether that's in a hard copy paper Bible like this or whether it's going to your favorite Bible app and listening to the text, we just want to encourage you to uh, spend time listening to it, reading it over and over again. It's only four chapters. It'll take you about 10 minutes to read it through in one sitting. Uh, So we encourage you to just spend time doing that as a way of preparing your hearts for next Sunday. But starting a new series next week means that today is the last message in the series we've been in currently looking at the I am sayings of Jesus. And today we come to the final and last saying where Jesus says, I am the true vine. Anybody else have experience uh, gardening? Anybody? Anybody? Okay, handful of you, number of you. Um, my wife and I, we have a garden in our backyard right now. Uh, here's some of the things that you'll see if you go to our house. We've got peppers, we've got mints, we've got, uh, we've got broccoli, we've got green beans, we've got snow peas, we've got raspberries, we've got all kinds of stuff, and we're actually seeing some amount of fruitfulness, so that's a, uh, that's a positive for us. Um, but this is, yeah, this is, uh, this is our garden, uh, and it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a thrilling, it's a unique thing to, to have your hands in the dirt. And some of you who have gardened uh, know this, that uh, there's a connection that we can have to a passage like this, where Jesus uses this metaphor of vine and branches, this sort of gardening metaphor. There's a connection we can have to this passage uh, that we can only understand it, uh, there's a depth we can go that we can only understand if we've actually been in the dirt and actually grown something. Now, I think that what makes this passage so so unique and so powerful for Jesus' original hearers is that Jesus lived in a largely agricultural society. Now for us, who who live in this context and sort of first ring suburb of uh, the Minneapolis area here in Minnesota, uh, gardening for us is kind of a novelty, right? Uh, We we can garden if we want, but we don't have to. (laughs) We can just go to Cub and buy whatever we want, and if we say, you know, I would rather not buy zucchini at Cub or Target, I'll just grow my own, and so we can do that. But it's not a matter of life and death. Gardening for us is, in a way, kind of a novelty, but in the time in which Jesus was speaking these words, uh, this was not a novelty, this was an essential. Uh, Living off of the land was the only way that you fed your family. And so this metaphor uh, is particularly powerful, and I think that we're going to be uh, seeing some some of the depth of that this morning. As we look at the text, what we see is there's three different sort of parts to this text. Uh, There's verses 1 to 4, 5 to 8, and 9 to 17. And and as Jesus so often does, he sort of speaks in cycles, where he'll say one thing, and then he'll say it again in a little bit different way, but add some more detail, and then he'll say it again in a different way. And it's sort of a, it it really is a Hebraic, uh, Middle Eastern way of thinking and writing, where you just say it over and over again and sort of spill in some more detail as you go, and that's what we're going to see him doing. And so let's think about what this means when Jesus says that he is the true vine. And let's begin by looking at verse, starting in verse 1. Jesus says to his disciples, I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. 
No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. So when Jesus uses this metaphor of the vine and the branches, uh, some commentators think that uh, what sparked this conversation is that Jesus and his disciples, as we're told at the end of chapter 14, uh, they leave the upper room and they may have traveled through the temple courts. And as they did, over the top of the uh, linen cloth that separated the holy place was a large uh, relief carving made out of pure gold of a, of, a, uh, of a grapevine. And so that may have been what sparked Jesus to have this conversation with his disciples. But nonetheless, he says to them, I am the true vine, and we see him using language of vine, we see him using language over and over again of fruitfulness. And so what we see here is there's sort of some hyperlinks uh, that would lead us back to thinking about some themes that we see come up first in the Old Testament. And so for us to really understand the depths of what Jesus is saying here, we've got to sort of look backwards to the Old Testament. And as we do, we, we see this metaphor of vine. Jesus says, I am the true vine. Well, throughout the Old Testament, the vine or a vineyard was a common metaphor used to refer to the nation of Israel. And so we see in places like Psalm 80, the psalmist says, you transplanted a vine from Egypt and you drove out the nations and planted it. You cleared the ground for it and it took root and filled the land. So what he, the image he uses to describe God delivering his people and causing them to flourish in the land is an agricultural metaphor of you planted a vine and that, that vine was fruitful, it grew and filled the land. We see also places in Isaiah chapter 5 where the, uh, the prophet says, I will sing for the one I love a song about his vineyard. My loved one had a vineyard on a fertile hillside. He dug it up and cleared it of stones and planted it with the choicest vines. He built a watchtower in it and cut out a wine press as well. Now, one of the things that we, it was maybe not as clear in the Psalm 80 passage that, that becomes clear here is that most of the time in the Old Testament when this language, this metaphor of uh, vine or vineyard is used, it's almost exclusively used in a negative way to talk about the bad fruit that comes out of the nation of Israel or, co- or, or to describe their fruitlessness. So we see the prophet saying at the end of this verse, then he looked for a crop of good grapes, but it yielded only bad fruit. And so we see this image of Israel is called a vine, but typically that vine is fruitless or produces only bad fruit. And so that's what would be in the minds of Jesus' original hearers is this sort of understanding of Israel as a fruitless vine. And so then Jesus comes along and says to his disciples, I am the true vine. And what he's saying is he's saying, I am the true Israel. Everything that Israel was intended to be, everything that Israel was supposed to be and failed to be, I am the fulfillment of that that people of Israel. And so we see him using this language of the vine. We also see him using many times the language of fruit or fruitfulness. Now, again, this is one of those metaphors that goes all the way back to the very beginning of the Bible uh, in the foundational chapters of the book of Genesis where God creates human beings in his image, in his likeness, and then the text says God blessed them and said, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living thing that moves on the ground. So God created human beings in his image. He blessed them, commanded them to be prosperous, to be fruitful, And he tells us what that means, that we are to live as co-rulers over creation with God. And we are to, through our human vocation, through the way that we are wise stewards of the creation, we are to take the the flourishing and, and the beauty and the abundance that was in the garden and expand it into every corner of the earth. So that's the that's the purpose of Genesis chapter one. We also see then after Adam and Eve failed at this. They were fruitless. They rebelled against God. God then chose the man named Abraham to enact this plan of redemption and salvation through him. And we see in Genesis 12, I will make you into a great nation, God says to Abram, and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So notice the repetition of the language of blessing that's used over and over and over again that that will draw our minds back to God blessing Adam and Eve in the original creation. 
And so what, he's, what God is doing is he's taking this man, Abram, and he's saying, through you and through your descendants, I'm going to bring a kind of Eden-like fruitfulness into the world. Everything that was lost in the garden, I'm going to, through your family line, I'm going to make it all right once again, and it's through you and through your lineage that the, that the blessings of God and the abundance of God are going to flow once again into the world. And then you have Jesus in this passage, who comes along and says, I am the true vine. He cuts off every branch that does not bear fruit so that it will be even more fruitful. And Jesus uses this language saying that he is the one through whom the fruitfulness that was promised is going to come. So Jesus comes along and, and, and says, in all the ways that Israel failed, I did not fail. The blessing that was intended to come into the world through the nation of Israel that failed to produce the blessing is coming through me. And so what we see, and Jesus uses this metaphor of he is the vine, what he's saying is this. He is the one, he is the true channel through which the blessing of God flows into the world. So that's what Jesus means when he says that he is the true vine, that he is the the one through whom all of the blessing of God is going to come into the world. And so we see that he's the fulfillment of everything that Israel was called to be, they could never be. He's the fulfillment of all the, the, the promises, the fulfillment of all of the, everything with the sacrifices and, and the rituals and the festivals and everything that Israel had longed for, everything that Israel had hoped for. Jesus is saying, I am that true vine. I am the one through whom the blessing of God is coming into the world. But then he takes this a step further and he says in verse 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. So he says, my father is the gardener, I am the vine, and now he says, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourself to be my disciples. So he takes us a step further and says, I'm the vine, you are the branches. Now I want to just pause here and, and, and highlight the, the intimacy that Jesus is communicating here. I think oftentimes we look at Jesus saying, you know, I'm, I'm the good shepherd. And you've got this picture of Jesus holding a fluffy lamb. And you know, you've got these pictures of Jesus leaving the 99 to go after the one and, and the, the tender loving care of the shepherd. And they know his voice and, and they understand his voice and, and, and all this, this wonderful intimacy that's bound up in that, in that relationship. And certainly there is intimacy bound up in the relationship between Jesus and his sheep. But think about the, the vital and organic nature of the relationship between vines and branches. There's an organic kind of interconnectedness that does not exist between a shepherd and a sheep. And so Jesus says, I'm the vine, you are the branches. And so there's this interconnectedness, and, and kind of the way you can think about it is this. Without the vine, the branches have no life. Right? Jesus has said it is, it is through the, the, the vine sucking up the water and producing nutrients for the branches. If you cut a branch off, the branch will die. So without the vine, the branches have no life. But on the other hand, without the branches, the vine has no fruit. So the vine itself doesn't produce the fruit. It's the branches that come off of the vine that produce the fruit. And so you, just, you can sort of, as you mull this over, you can see these, the, the level of intimacy that Jesus is communicating when he says, I am the vine, you are the branches. I am in you, you are in me. And he says, if you're connected to me, you will bear fruit. And so we should think about for just a moment, what is, what is the kind of fruitfulness that Jesus has in mind? What, is, what, does, what does fruitfulness look like? Well, he gives us uh, four different ways that the fruitfulness looks like in this passage. He says, first, it looks like obedience to Jesus' commands. In verse 9, he says, As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept the Father's commands and remain in his love. So keeping the commands of Jesus, following the way of Jesus. And this is sort of like in Matthew 28. Where Jesus says, I'm calling you to go make disciples, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. 
So he doesn't say, okay, remember that one sermon? Remember that one checklist of teaching that I gave you? He says, no, teach them to obey everything I've commanded you. So this is comprehensive, whole life of Jesus, whole life of his disciples that we are called to embody and to, and to, to practice and to model. So obeying Jesus' commands is the first kind of fruitfulness that we see here. We also see, he says, an experience of Jesus' joy is the kind of fruitfulness. He says in verse 11, I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. So he's, he's saying that the joy and the intimacy that, that exists between the Father and the Son, you get to share in that joy. And so if you are connected to me, the vine you will have a fruitfulness that looks like a kind of joy that exists, the same kind of joy that exists between me and the Father. So fruitfulness looks like an obedience to Jesus' commands. It looks like an experience of his joy. It also looks like love for one another. Jesus says in verse 13, my command is this, love each other as I have loved you. So with the same kind of self-giving, self-sacrificing, laying down your preferences, dying to yourselves, that's the kind of love that we are to display for one another. Choosing to take up our cross, to die to ourselves, to pour ourselves out so that others can flourish. Jesus says, love one another as I have loved you. And this is an evidence, it's a kind of fruitfulness that comes with being connected to the vine. And the last kind of fruitfulness we see in this passage is witness to the world. It says in verse 16, You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit. Fruit that will last, and so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give to you. When Jesus prays for his disciples in chapter 17, verse 18, he he prays, As you have sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. So in other words, there's a witness to the world in some ways, that's rooted in, as we live in obedience to Jesus, as we experience the, something of the joy of Jesus, as we love one another, that in and of itself is a kind of witness to the world. And we are called to, uh, to, to, to love people and to serve people and to, and to urge them to follow Jesus, who is the bread of life, who is the good shepherd, who is the true vine. We're called to lead people to become followers of Jesus. And so that's a kind of fruitfulness. So obedience to Jesus' commands, an experience of his joy, love for one another, witness to the world. Now this is not a, Jesus does not say that you need to be awesome at all of these things all of the time. Because let's be honest, uh, there are certain ones of these that maybe we would say, yeah, that's, that's, that's maybe easier for me than other ones. But certainly there's some of this fruitfulness where we say, yeah, I'm not sure I see a whole lot of that in my life. And so I don't think Jesus is holding this up saying, unless you do all of this all the time, you're going to get cut off. This is the, I think he's describing the fruitfulness comes from life lived in this direction. It's a life that is lived towards the direction, towards an increase in obedience, an increase of joy, an increase of love for one another, an increase of love for the world. And there, there's a warning in here, right? Do you remember that when Jesus said in verse 2, he said, He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. So he says, that if, if you don't bear fruit, you'll be cut off and cast into the fire, which is a common Old Testament metaphor for cast into the judgment and the justice of God. So if you're not bearing fruit, you'll just be cut off altogether. But then he says, if you are bearing fruit, you'll get pruned. <laughs> so th- think about this. Th- there, is, there is no option where God leaves you alone. <laughs> right? there, is, there is no like, easy, safe, comfortable option of like, I can just kind of keep to myself and go to church every once in a while and, and just you know, sort of read my Bible maybe and, and you know, kind of just sort of... Th- there, is, there is no option that is not a painful option. It is a painful thing for God to prune us. And maybe you can point to a season or a moment in your life where you say, you know, I, I know that this was the Lord pruning me, and it hurts. But Jesus loves his disciples enough, the Father loves his disciples enough to prune them 
And if you've done any work with trees or any kind of bushes that need pruning, you know that for them to truly flourish, for them to grow the way they are intended to, they have to be pruned. It's not an option. You have to prune them in order to keep them alive and healthy. And Jesus says the Father loves us enough to do that for us, to prune us. And so whereas we have seen before that Jesus is the true channel through which the blessing of God comes into the world, in these next verses what we see is this. The Spirit of Christ in us is the true source of our life and fruitfulness. Jesus has said, if you are in me, I am in you. And later in chapter 16, he's going to go on to say, it's better that I leave because when I leave, I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit who's going to be with you. So Christ is present with us through his Spirit. And he says it's good for us that he leaves so that we can have the Spirit. And as the Spirit works inside of us, it's the Spirit of Christ in us who is the true source of life and fruitfulness. So if we are connected to the vine and the Holy Spirit is at work among us, that will result in us bearing a kind of fruitfulness and living life the way that we were designed to live. So Jesus says he is the true vine, we are the branches. And then he goes on to say, in verse 9, he says, As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. He's already told us in verse 4, Remain in me, and I also remain in you. So the question then for us to kind of ponder in the rest of our time here this morning is this. What does it mean to remain in him? What does it mean for us to remain in him? Well, if, if there's a couple different angles we could look at this from. Uh, if we ask the question, well, what does it look like to remain in him? Well, Jesus tells us something of what it looks like. He says in verse 10, if you keep my commands, you will remain in my love. And then he tells us what his command is. Verse 17, this is my command, love each other. So a life that is lived in loving one another as Christ has loved us, that is what it looks like. That, that's sort of the outward expression of what it looks like to remain in him. But there's another way we can kind of look at this, and that's to ask, okay, well, not just what do we do, but how are we supposed to do it? What's the, what's the motivation that's underneath the surface that's driving us to a life of pouring ourselves out to love other people? Because if you've noticed, sometimes people are hard to love. Right? Has anybody had any experience of finding it hard to love other people? Even within your own church family, people who believe different th things about different subjects or different things than you do, it's hard to love one another. So how do we do it? What's, what's the catalyst? What's the motivation for us loving one another well? like Jesus calls us to. Well, he tells us. Life in Christ flows out of our new identity in Christ. Life in Christ flows out of our new identity in Christ. Look at what he says. In verse 12, my command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you. So what we see here is a seismic shift in God's relationship to his people. And this is the underlying motivation that leads us to live a life of love for one another. Now, throughout the Old Testament, there are a couple different places where somebody is called a friend of God. So Abraham, uh, it, it's not actually used in the, the actual passage in Genesis, uh, but in James, we're told that Abraham was a friend of God. Moses, as he would sit at the entrance of the tent of meeting, we're told, would talk to God face to face as one talks with a friend. Throughout the Old Testament, the nation of Israel as a whole is not called the friend of God. On a couple occasions, they're called the son of God. But most often, the people of Israel, the people of God, are called servant. They're the servant of God, the servant of the Lord. And so, it's only at these sort of covenantal high points 
where this new thing that God is doing through Abraham, it's only at this covenantal high point where God has given his law to his people, now he's physically present with them in the tent of meeting in the tabernacle. It's only in these key moments and only for a few people that there, anybody has ever called a friend of God. We're called servants. But Jesus says, I have come to lay down my life for you so that you can be my friends. Do you see the significance of this? Jesus came to lay down his life, as he says in this passage, to lay down his life for his enemies so that his enemies can become his friends. Now, I, I know that for us, the, the word friend, we filter this through our context of Facebook exists, right? And so there, there's places like Facebook and Instagram and all these other sort of social media where you can have dozens and hundreds of quote-unquote friends. And so in some way, the word friend is somewhat diluted. It can just mean anybody who has any kind of connection to you relationally whatsoever, even if they just sort of creep on you from a distance. <laughs> you can be called somebody's friend. Now, I think there's something unique and important about calling us friends. Jesus does use the language of calling us sons and daughters. We are brothers and sisters to one another. So there's that family relationship that's really important. Jesus has brought us into the family of God but we're not just family, we're also friends. Think about this. You love your family because they're your family. You don't have a choice in who's in your family. You don't have a choice in when you get born or where you get born or into what kind of family or what kind of upbringing you're gonna have. You just have those people that are your family and you love them because they are your family. Even if they drive you crazy, you still love them because they are your family. But you love your friends because you choose to love your friends. Notice the difference. Jesus says, you are my friends, meaning I have chosen to love you. Friends, God chose to love us while we were his enemies, the Bible says. While we were unlovable, he chose to love us and give us this new identity as friends, and, and when we are clothed with Christ, we become lovely. It's easy to see what is unlovable in other people, isn't it? Very easy to see things in other people that are unlovable. And I think that, it, that if we're honest with ourselves, if we, if we had moments of quietness, where we slowed down, I think that all of us would be able to identify things in our life that we would say, yeah, this is, that's kind of ugly. This is something about my personality, about my way of life, about my thoughts, that's really unlovable. And for many of us, it, 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 would, be, it would be a horrifying thing for what we think about and what we do in secret to be broadcast publicly because nobody would love us if they could see what really goes on inside. And there's a sense that we all have of this unloveliness on the inside. And the good news about Jesus is that Jesus came to lay down his life to make us his friends and to make us who are unlovable to make us lovely, to make us beautiful, and in doing so, he makes us his friends. And it's only when we understand the gospel it's only when we see Jesus laying down his life to make us his friends that we will have the motivation and the resources to be able to love other people in that way. And so my encouragement to you, as we think about Jesus as the true vine, as we think about being in him and remaining in him, I just want to encourage you that God chose to love you. And I want to urge you to believe the gospel today to believe the gospel that God didn't just, doesn't just tolerate you, but that he loves you and finds you lovely in Christ. And for some of us believing that, maybe for the first time, for some of us, it is the, we can't count how many times we have over and over again reminded ourselves of the truth of the gospel. But I want to encourage you today to remember that it's life in Christ that flows out of a 
new identity with Christ. This is good news for us. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the richness of what the Bible says about our relationship with you. Lord, we thank you for being the true vine and for grafting us in as branches. Lord, we pray that you would teach us what it means to remain in you. Lord, we confess how often we have not remained in you, how often we have not loved one another, how often we have not lived in light of the reality that you laid down your life to make us your friends. And so, Lord, we ask for your forgiveness for the ways that we have failed to see and believe the good news about Jesus. And we pray that you would help us. Lord, help us as we encounter everyday challenges, everyday relationships, every day in our vocation. Lord, enable us to be people who rest in our identity that's been given in you, that we are friends of God. So thank you, Lord. We pray that you would teach us how to remain in you. We ask all this in the name of Jesus. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. Do you stand in worship with us? There is no other so sure and steady. My hope is held in your hands. When castles crumble, and breath is fleeting upon this rock i will stand upon this rock i will stand glory glory we have no other king but jesus lord of all Raise the anthem, our loudest praises ring, we crown him Lord of all. You'll kindly rule us, shattered and broke. Since tyranny, my life is hidden beneath heaven's shadow. Your crimson flood covers me. Your crimson flood covers me. Glory, glory. Ah! 
is a lion, the lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles in every knee. I remind you that in the back of the sanctuary as you exit, there's a station in the back where you can uh, give your tithes and offerings to support God's work here at Elmwood. I want to encourage you to, uh, if you're able to, uh, stop out and see the Abel family out there and say hi and get connected with them and their ministry. Uh, just please don't all rush around and crowd the table. Uh, try and maintain some amount of uh, social distancing while you're out there, but uh, make sure to connect with them this morning. As you go from here today back into your homes and your neighborhoods and your vocations and every place you go, would you receive this benediction? Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God our Savior be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen. Go in peace.